Big Rig by Louise Hawes, a first chapter Friday read aloud video with the word nerd. Today as you listen, play along. Watch for the story quote that will appear on screen. Write it down word by word and then follow the instructions given to you by your teacher. Make sure to stay all the way to the end to see if you've written it down correctly. Hi, my name is Amanda Zebo. Welcome to my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd, in another First Chapter Friday video. This week, I'm going to be reading to you from Big Rig by Louise Howes, and I just finished reading this book like minutes ago. Uh, I was sitting in my favorite reading spot, my favorite summer reading spot. I'll put a picture of it right here so you can see it. Um, it's just like the coziest little spot on my front porch. Um, and my thoughts are all like a flutter and swirling um, about this book. And so I'm going to try not to ramble, but um, I have I have a lot of thoughts. Um, my first thought is that I'm not sure if I were the author, I would end it the way that this author ended it. And that's not to say it's a bad ending. It's just like maybe if I were the writer, I would have done something different. That's not like a bad thing or a critique. It's It just shows that I was so invested in the story and the characters. I love them so much that that my mind started to wander and think about what I would hope for them to do. Um, so if you've ever read a book and you're like, oh, I, I maybe wish they would have done something different, um, that's not a bad thing. It just means that you really connected with the characters um, and maybe it means that you're a writer. Um, here's the other thing about this book. Uh, sometimes when I read a book, I'm like, oh, teachers, this is the book you want to teach next. That's got great content connections. Or like, this is a book everybody in your whole class will love, no matter who they are. Um, I think that this book has a very specific reader. And so I'm really happy I'm sharing it with you in the summer because it's the perfect kind of summer reading book. Um, if you are a person who uh, lives with one parent, um, this would be a great book for you. If you are a person who lives a kind of unconventional lifestyle, say like in a semi truck, um, this book might be for you. If you're a person who is always trying to figure out like what's next, or like you have a big dream for your life, uh, this book might be for you. If you like kind of like crazy cast of characters, like everybody like kind of just melting into this uh, world, um, you're gonna love this book. There's just so many uh, unique aspects of the story. Uh, there's there's a cat. Uh, there's there's a flood um there's semi trucks uh there's music there's just so many so many things about this story uh that are interesting and i think you're gonna love it i i said i wasn't gonna ramble and then i kind of did um but hopefully something i said caught your attention and you want to keep listening i'm gonna read you the blurb because the author did a much better job of telling you about the story probably than i just did life on the road is as good as it gets for hazmat and her dad Together, they've been hauling freight and crisscrossing the U.S. for years. Now there's talk about putting down roots. Somewhere Hazmat can go to a real school and make friends her own age. Somewhere her dad doesn't have to mail order textbooks about nature's promise to all women. That's something else. If you're like, hmm, body changing, puberty, what's it like? I, I wonder, blah, blah, blah. Like, this character goes through that. Maybe it'd be helpful for you. Somewhere her mom's ashes can rest on a mantle and not on a dashboard. Well, everything just keeps changing sometimes in some ways hazel can't control and she isn't ready to give up the freedom of a long distance trucking sure the road is filled with surprises from plane crashes and robo trucks to runaway hitchhikers and abandoned babies but all that just makes for great stories so hazmat hatches a plan to make sure her dad's dream of settling down never becomes a reality because there's only one place hazmat belongs in the navigator seat right next to her dad with the whole country flying by and each day different from the last. So I'm gonna read you chapter one of Big Rig by Louise Hawes. So you can fall in love with this story and then get all the way to the end and let me know what you think. Chapter one is called For the Record. My father drives an 18 wheeler. My mother died a week after I was born, and even though this is not a ghost story, the three of us have been on the road together for seven years. I don't mean that mom is some shapeless blob of ectoplasm or that she rides in her own seat, moves furniture around, and talks to us from the ether. I mean that ever since I was little, daddy and I have traveled with a green marble box with her ashes inside. I mean that my dad loves her so much and I dream and think about her so often, it just feels like she's part of our team. 
So yes, all three of us have logged over 560,000 miles, spent the night in 310 cities, and listened to 1,400 or 1,430 audiobooks. I know because I handle the GPS, read the maps. Daddy says technology is fine as long as you don't count on it. Keep the logs, and since my father is all for equal votes and entertainment, I choose half of the audiobooks that we listen to. Which is why I also know I might have to change that audio total back to 1,429. I like to keep really accurate log data, but I hate to erase things that leave a smudge mark for the way station fuss budgets to cluck their tongues over. Why am I seeing smudge marks in my future? Because just now, headed east on 80 toward Iowa City, my father pulled to the shoulder of the highway and yanked a CD out of the deck after only a few minutes. It was my turn to choose, and I was really looking forward to Zombie Lullaby, which I think is a great title. In the opening scene, they have already been three blood-curdling murders, one excellently scary undead villain, and severed and a severed head that doesn't just talk but rolls around moaning and looks beseechingly at everyone it bumps into. Maybe the head was too much for Daddy because now he leans across the cab and waves the disc in front of me. You're 11 years old, Hazel, for crying out loud, he says, and this book is much too violent. I decide not to mention that my birthday is less than six months away, which makes me almost 12. When my father, who's tall and mostly arms and legs, makes big I know what's best for you gestures and gets in my face like this, our truck's cab feels way too small. Normally, it may not be wide enough for jumping jacks, but there's plenty of room to read, sleep, and eat. Suddenly, though, I need more space. I want to look out the window, find tiny doll people riding in four-wheelers down there, or watch the sky and highway streaming past like they're caught in a windy river. Instead, I sit up, straight, and look Daddy in the eye where I can reach him. How about we at least get to know the main characters, I ask. My father used to be an English lit professor, and he's always talking about how the people in books are what makes the difference. People, not plot, he says to me all the time. Now he shakes his head, half smiles. And he says, good guys or bad guys? I look at the green marble box velcroed to our dash. Let's ask mom, I ask. We're both quiet. We look toward the box, swirly and elegant stone on the outside, ashes sealed on the inside, and we wait. She says either one will work, I tell daddy after a while. He sighs and then hands me the CD. I put it in and we turn back onto the highway and listen to zombie lullaby for another 20 minutes. There are more murders more rolling heads, more undead villains, all who say the same thing. You must die, over and over and over again. We're about three hours from the world's largest truck, truck stop off Iowa 80. I love the pulled pork sandwiches there, and Daddy likes the vintage trucks at the truck museum, which means we have more than enough time to hear the rest of the book. But sad to say, those villains have gotten pretty boring, and it turns out Mom was right. It doesn't make any difference which side I choose, the good or the bad. They're just as boring. The good guys are just as boring as the bad ones. First of all, they keep dying off. And second, they repeat things just like the zombies do. There's a detective who can't be very smart because she keeps telling her friends, I'm close, I know I'm close. And of course she's right. She is close to her own grisly end. But I don't have the staying power to see how and when she meets the same fate as the rest of the townspeople. I press pause and look at daddy. Okay, if I turn this off, I ask him, I can't invest in this. That's professor talk. It means there's no one to root for. My father's smile grows from half to full on. He can't turn to face me because the traffic's too heavy, but it's plain to see even in profile how relieved he is. Once again, we've settled one of our problems by letting mom decide things. We do that a lot. Sometimes I think I remember my mother. In dreams, she holds me with one hand and runs a finger down my newborn nose with the other. I hear the sound of her voice as if it's happening right now, not 11 years ago. Don't grow up, Hazel Denise Sampson. Don't you dare grow an inch. I want you like this, just like this, forever. But Daddy and I talk about her so much and paw over those old photos in the glove compartment so often, I can't be sure which are real memories and which are things I've heard or made up. What I know for sure about Mom is that she couldn't have been much like me. For one thing, she had thick red hair, not mouse brown. Daddy insists my hair is skinny blonde, but that's just plain wishful thinking. In the picture I like best, Mom's wearing a white blouse embroidered with roses, and her hair, it's even brighter than all those flowers put together. 
Another thing I'm sure about is that she was smarter than Daddy, and he's the smartest person ever. Not just because he's got a PhD, but because he's taught me everything I know except the lyrics to One Dimension songs. He can recite the whole last act of just about any Shakespeare play, and he can prove that everything in the universe is growing, including dirt. If he says my mother could think and talk circles around him, I believe it. Her name was Glory, which sounds more elegant than Hazel and way more elegant than Hazmat. That's my trucker handle. Drivers almost never use their real names on the road. Ever since Daddy's boss and his best friend gave me my nickname, hardly anyone calls me Hazel, unless they're mad at me. Hazmat is short for hazardous material, so you can probably guess that in the beginning, at least, Mason Shields of Shields Trucking didn't think it was a very good idea for Daddy to take me on the road. In fact, he figured I'd be downright dangerous. I was only four the day Daddy asked Mason about driving with me. That was the first time I ever heard the two of them disagree. Anything could happen, Blake, his friend told Daddy, and trust me, he didn't mean anything good. All the big trunking companies feel the same way, and they have strict rules about family and ride-alongs. But Daddy and Mason have been friends forever, and Daddy didn't see why a two-truck firm couldn't bend the rules to let his cute but too small to see out the window without a pillow and her car seat daughter to go with him. Apparently, though, there were lots of reasons. Hell, Mason told Daddy, if they don't get you for truancy and endangering a minor, Hazman here could end up with colic or crawl under a wheel or get lost at a truck stop or... Four-year-olds don't get colic, Mason. According to Daddy, Mason worries too much, and according to Mason, worrying is in his blood. Even though they're like brothers and went to high school and college together, Daddy is white and Mason is black, which means that only one of them grew up with what Mason calls daily advisory warnings. My mom wouldn't let me out the door, he says, till I recited three rules. Watch your front, watch your back, and never, ever talk back. The day they fought about me, Daddy took a deep breath and slowed down, like he's always telling me to do. But his voice got way too loud, and he used his fingers to count all the ways Mason was wrong. You can't be truant if you're not old enough to go to school. You've taken Shepard on the road, and my daughter is a lot smarter than a puppy, for God's sake. And if Hazel gets lost, I'll get lost with her. My father stopped at three fingers and then took them all down and put his arm around me in a bear hug. We're a team, right? I turned into a pre-K bobblehead, grinning and nodding, grinning and nodding. I was so busy nodding and smiling, I hardly noticed when Daddy took his arm off me and put it around Mason. When he pulled him close and told him not to be such a worry wart and that he'd already promised my mom he's going to be both a father and a mother. Mason folded his arms and shook his head. And me? He asked. Where does what I think figure in all this? Daddy started to answer, but Mays held his hand out in front of him like the tight end with a football. First of all, Hazmat's the closest thing I've ever had to a kid of my own, and if you're not going to worry about her, somebody has to. Second, in case you've forgotten, it's my company, and third, it's my truck. And it's not you that's going to pay the price if some busybody at a weigh-in station wants to know why she's not in kindergarten. There were a lot more arguments, and sometimes both Daddy and Maze forgot to follow my father's rule about taking a deep breath. In the end, though, Maze agreed to bid some really short hauls to give his new team a chance to prove ourselves. And Daddy agreed that we'd always stay at Mason's house in between runs. The day we drove off on our first job, I didn't even know enough to realize how much I was going to miss Mason and his wife, Serena. I just clutched the bear Serena gave me for the trip and waved to them from my perch in the passenger seat. I'd already taken short rides in Daddy's high as a house truck, and I couldn't imagine anything better than living in it for good. Seven years later, I still feel the exact same way. Sure, Leonardo, that's what we named our rig, doesn't seem quite as gigantic now as when I was four. And he's what you'd have to call a senior citizen truck. At over 20 years old, he's missing some bells and whistles, as Daddy calls them, but who really needs a built-in microwave or heated seats? Besides, age has its advantages. Trucks as old as Leonardo don't need to use electric logging devices, which means my paper logs are just fine. Not to mention our truck tends to get a lot of compliments. Other truckers stand around and admire the paint job Mason spent a fortune on, and the chrome exhaust stacks, great rig, they tell Daddy, or a long-nosed Pete, now there's a classic. So I wouldn't trade being homeschooled by my dad in a traveling classroom or falling asleep in my top bunk under the glow-in-the-dark constellations he put on the roof of the cab or meeting old friends at every truck stop or swinging between coasts like a pendulum. I wouldn't trade all that for anything, anywhere, ever. Which brings me to growing up. 
I've decided to postpone it indefinitely. Daddy says that when I'm older, we'll quit trucking and buy a house just like Mason's. He gets all poetic about the barbecue grill in our future backyard and the four-poster bed in my future bedroom and all the warm, accepting fellow classmates in my future public school where I'll finally blossom into my full potential because of group learning. When he goes on these imaginary journeys into tomorrow, my father's voice changes. It gets loud and sounds like the computer voice that asks you to hold and listen to the music while you wait to talk to an actual person. I can tell he's not really that excited about public education or quitting trucking or splitting up our father-daughter team, but he's so convinced that I need other kids and teachers in my life and he works so hard at describing how I'll love every future minute of it that I haven't found a way to tell him that I'm not gonna be anywhere without him. Instead, I play along. So when I'm in junior high, I ask, can I dye my hair blue? Ask your mother, he says. I look at the box on the dash. Mom? I listen for a minute. She says, sure. Daddy shakes his head and smiles. Figures, he says kind of sadly, kind of proudly. That's just like her. If you want to find out what happens next to Hazmat and her dad and their big truck, uh, chapter two is called They Don't Make Them Like They Used To. And I think that if you're a special kind of reader, you're going to really like this book. And that's my favorite thing about books is that there is a book for everyone. Not all books are for everybody, but there's one out there for you and maybe this one is it. Thank you so much for joining me today uh, on the, for this first Chapter Friday video. I hope you come back again. Uh, for more, please like this video and subscribe. I'll put links for everything down in the video description box. I'll see you again next time. Happy reading. To continue reading Big Rig by Louise Hawes, pick up a copy from your school library, purchase one from your favorite local indie bookstore, or grab it via the link in the description box. Then be sure to check out the rest of the first Chapter Friday playlist. I've got almost 200 books ready and waiting for you and a little bit of something for everybody. Graphic novels, novels in verse, prose novels, exciting novels, novels that will make you cry, everything. So head on over and check it out. This week's mystery quote says, saying no to destiny means saying yes to whatever comes next. Thanks so much for visiting my channel, Learning with the Word Nerd. I hope you come back again for more First Chapter Friday videos, brain breaks, direct teaching videos, and more. Please subscribe and like this video. And teachers, sign up to get this information delivered directly to your inbox. Ideas, lessons, videos, resources, and more. Tons of freebies are waiting for you at the link in the video description box. I'll see you again next time. Happy reading.